Thanks for coming back from the lunch. I hope you, you enjoyed it. It's actually quite good here. And thanks for coming by for the Java Money talk, especially given that have any of you, who many, how many are here for the first time? Okay, so then it's definitely new for most of you because a subset, a slightly different uh, take on, on the same JSR was presented at the uh, XDEFCON, which happens in a separate track here at JCon last year on the last day. So I hope those of you who have been here last year are not too bored by the topic, but as, you, as there were many hands that are first timers, I guess it will be something new to learn. So a little bit about myself. I'm one of the maintenance leads of both the money JSR and after it finalized also the use of measurement JSR that we had a talk about yesterday. Um, yes, I'm Anatol. Um, I am, uh, was the original spec lead of the money JSR um, and also for the one that finished the JSR years ago. And um, as you see here, I'm also in engaged in with other topics in other areas, basically. Mostly working more in the computing foundation space, so in the more modern, more modern stuff. More. So the, the motivation for starting a new JSR was that the Java Util currency, which existed pretty much since the very first uh, JDK, and it has not really, except for a few builders here and there, there haven't been too many enhancements. And it's very strict, and it only allows to use ISO standard currency. So if, for example, a company internally has a slightly different scheme or a different data source with different uh, currency codes, then they're out of luck and they usually have to somehow map that. And the formatting also lacks flexibility. There were a few earlier approaches, although some of them were mostly academic. Martin Fowler and Eric Evans, I guess both are very common names in software engineering, but they mostly did this to show it on conferences uh, or use it in their books. But neither of these approaches were really production ready. This is an example that's actually used in production. Uh, before I, I had to hire my own accountant to do the business and accounting and uh, taxes for my company, I use this one quite a lot. Uh, it's also based on Java and Swing. But so far, it doesn't seem to use uh, JSR 354. I guess they have a stable product that they don't want to change it that much. It's similar to, for example, Microsoft Money, which doesn't exist in that form anymore. So some of the goals were to keep it simple so that people don't have to learn everything from scratch uh, when they dealt with, for example, Java Util currency also to allow performance uh, in high frequency trading where nanoseconds are sometimes relevant between changing stock values or currency exchange rates, but also keeping the precision intact so there's no loss because of rounding, for example. We try to reuse the existing number formats wherever possible, but also, for example, there are cases like the Indian rupees, which differ and which the JDK since, I don't know, I think 2007 or 2011, there is a bug and nobody in the open JDK team really found it important enough. Yeah, it's not simple to fix it in the JDK because the mechanism how the decibel format actually implements formatting does, does not comply with this requirement at all. You have to rewrite the whole forward thing in the JDK to, to fix that bug. That's the reason I think why it is not fixed. Here's another case. Uh, we have another slide where Anna's will be going to more detail about the rounding mechanisms, but for example in Argentina the rounding is also different from other countries. So 
So here's a quick overview. In the Java 8 plus version uh, of the Oneta reference implementation, we actually split it into different modules, also modules in the sense of the Java module system, at least with the most recent version that we're going to release as a maintenance release in a couple of weeks. First question, does anybody use Java earlier than Java 8? Still, nobody. One. One. Okay. Which version? 1.4, okay. 1.4, wow, that's, that's, a, <laughs> <laughs> that's antique. Yeah. So most of these blocks also map directly to a particular module, at least in the newest version of the reference implementation. And after this maintenance release that also fixes a very old uh, license issue that we don't really want to bore you with, but there was some license that uh, Oracle and JCP mandated to new spec leads that have not been doing a lot of specs before, and Paddy Swiss was also told to use that, and they did, but then it basically uh, was a mismatch with how the open source community likes to use it, because there were a few clauses in there saying like, yeah, you're only allowed to use certain things uh, for evaluation and you have to destroy it after 30 days if you don't use it in production. So yeah, it's, a lot. It's, it's relatively simple. It's not the patchy license and basically that the thing is not redistributable and that's a real issue. But we already fixed that and we also addressed a few other bugs and now that the JCP and Oracle have come back from Oracle Code 1. Uh, there's also a, a new election coming up in the JCP with the executive committee getting new members. So we may wait raising it until the new EC takes their seats uh, at the end of November, but at least by then we expect to propose the maintenance release for voting by the executive committee. So by the end of the year there should be a maintenance release that fixes not only this license problem, but also addresses a few other things, including the Indian formatting. So, I think most of you are here to, to more listen to what actually this thing does. Let's start with currencies. As we mentioned, there is that ISO standard for currencies. And looking a bit more in detail what this standard provides, actually, may surprise a bit. It is a, for example, there are not only codes defined for money, like Swiss francs uh, or US dollars, but also for precious metals, XAU or XAEAG for Argentum and Aurum, which is silver and gold. There is a code XTS for testing even a code triple X for no currency at all, by the way, defined with a fractional digit number of zero, and always with a rounding to zero. So basically, a value of, of X, X, X is, is always zero, regardless what value originates. Then we have special cases of currencies, which actually comprise multiple nations, countries. For example, that CFP and CFA franc, which basically is uh, present in two countries. So there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between currencies and countries. Um, even worse, in Switzerland, even for Switzerland, you definitely think that about, about uh, strange cases. In Switzerland, we have basically free currency code for Swiss francs or for something like re related to Swiss francs. We have the CHF, which well, most of you will know probably. But there is also a CHE for Vir Euro. Vir is a special organization that actually uh, functions uh, like, like a, a trading society in Germany. Wirtschaftsring. And there is a Wirtschaftsring handling and, and purchasing things in, in Euro and one in, in Swiss francs but with a special uh, currency code from the ESO. 
then even for for the USA, for the US dollar, we have the normal US dollars uh, code, but we also have a USN for US dollars the next day and a USS for US dollars same day, which are used in trading. For me, one, a thing that doesn't belong to the standard at all. And then, as mentioned, there are also other things. For example, Indian rupees, you can buy things with Indian rupees, rupees in Bhutan and Nepal. That's good. But there is also Nepalese rupees where you can buy things in Nepal but not in India. These things are not represented at all. And then also when looking at uh, Bitcoin, which is uh, only an extended part of the ESO currency uh, present, there we have uh, multiple minor units. Which is not also which is also not represented in the standard. These are just to give you a, an insight that even such things as an ISO standard, you have to look at it carefully. Even then, um, which is things that are not mapped at all are all that kind of virtual currencies. Virtual currencies are basically currencies that are invented by someone that are valid. In some, in some whatever scope, typically a, a, a software platform where you spend your money to get that virtual currencies, you can then buy things that could be real things, or you can sell things, also real things, but you don't get real money, you get virtual money. And then at some point, you can also get back virtual money, convert back to real money. Bitcoin basically is not nothing else. It's just so big and so widely used that it's 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 even it's even got its own currency code. But we also have Facebook, Libra, for example, and other um, um, uh, currencies used in games or whatever kind of marketplaces. These are not uh, mapped at all in the currency area. That they also they are highly uh, changing all the time. So other things that is not present, that is not mapped in the currency class in the JDK is that we don't have historical currencies. I would uh, recommend read Wikipedia, what, is, what was happening in India the last 100 years. India being its own country, the Englands go in, um, redefine, change things, change things again, India got, got back into freedom, and every was, everything was, was related to some currency changes. Also in Europe, I would say most of you should remember the time before the euro was there. It was complete difference. We had Deutsche Mark, today we have euro. We have Austrian, uh, was waren das? Schilling. Schilling. Heute, we have euro, euros. Um, so this thing is not, not, not mapped at all. In that if I want to go back and perhaps do some historical calculations, I have to, need to know that. I have to be aware of which currency basically is valid in what country, at what time. Even with uh, inflation, this also can be a big, big, big importance point because uh, the values then for conversion should, should be, should, would be differ a lot. Then we have non-standard currencies. Um, it's a bit a strange example, but here are cows or camels meant. So if I marry somebody in some countries, it may be uh, some kind of currency that I have to, to pay something that I can marry that woman. Um, then as mentioned, also we have custom schemes. Since the currency standard does not map everything, we have to introduce in big financial institutions additional codes or systems that can handle this. In Credit Suisse, which was one of the, the, the company where I worked when, I, when we did that uh, specification here, actually we had a big currency table with a four digit key. So we could hand up up to 10,000 currencies. There are things therein like Deutsche Mark, Deutsche 
Reichsmark. There were things in like Credit Suisse gold coins and Credit Suisse caps. <laughs> if that all makes sense. No, definitely not. But just that's one well, thing. Are, are there still any Deutsche Reichsmark in the world, maybe of some Swiss banks, <laughs> even today? Could be. Also the, even what you, what you see, there was a big merger in, in Switzerland between Credit Suisse and the uh, Schweizerische Volksbank. And all, also these, these Volksbank currency code were merged in that big currency table. You even 20 years after the merger, you still see what data is coming from what company originally. Um, then I have, when I want to get out a currency uh, in the JDK, I have to know the currency code. Um, I think I, there is also currency by, can, can get it by locale, but I have to first to construct the locale, and in the locale there must be present a country. Um, the stuff that is going behind, it's everything goes behind to the Unicode consortium where, where these things are defined and this, it's the same data underneath also in the JDK. So it's, uh, it's good to know that it's, most of the cases it works. It works for current use cases, but there are limits. When you look at now, that's the interface that we have in the JSR. Um, when you look at get currency code, does that work here? I tried to read the button. Oh, okay, it comes. We look here at get currency code, get numeric code, and get default fraction digits. These are exactly the same methods as on the currency class from the JDK. Nothing fancy. What's new here is that we have a currency context. And that currency context can have additional information, like historical ranges, validation areas, whatever is valid for that kind of currency unit. So that's the way how we extended currency, but still um, ensure that it is mostly the same as we already have in the JDK from a usage perspective. There is also a buildable currency unit that's a builder where you can put together your own currency as you like. You can use that. Um, but most of the time, we just get and access a currency unit from the from monetary singleton, which we'll see later with just the currency code. Uh, that's exactly what you see here. You see here there is monetary. That is the most important singleton that is uh, present. You can get their currencies as well as factories for creating amounts. We will see that later. So you get here a currency, you use the currency, the ISO code. Um, you can also say, I get currency with a, with, a, with a certain code, and there is an ellipse operator, which is here not visible or not used, where you can define which currency provider, and you can register your own currency providers, actually should return your code, your currency instance. The default here, if nothing else is here, it just goes through the list of providers. Um, I will not tell you all, all the details how this list of providers can be organized, how pre providers can be ordered in significance and all these stuffs. And also, if you don't have written your own provider, basically it's the JDK util currency, which actually is backing up all these things here. So next point is amounts. The question first is, what is an amount? You would say, yeah, an amount is a number. That's great. But it's more than that, because an amount is a number and definitely a currency. That's one of the issue in the JDK. You don't have an amount class. You have big decimal. If you now pass around your big decimal numbers, you have to ensure somehow always that the currency that is related to that amount is always passed as well. So there, there is need for its own data type. Um, the, the problem is now, that's one of, a really a big problem, that's one of the problems we have discussed all the two years, more or less, 
is that you have basically contradictional requirements, um, especially to the number of representation amounts. You imagine, if, if you have an amount representing, let's say, the gross national product of all countries in the world, it's quite a big number. Um, we we um, just we would then convert everything in US dollar, that it really is the same currency, of course. If you do some production calculations where you, f you want to pr get out the product price for, let's say, a monthly fee for something that is going over 20 or 30 years, you definitely will require uh, for calculation of, uh, uh, of that financial um, uh, sub-products that you need in your calculations, you have to have a very big precision. Now that combined with trading, where everything that is uh, takes longer than 10 milliseconds is too slow, it's quite difficult to just implement that in one single number representation. If you use big decimal, you have the possibility for big precision, for big numbers but it's relatively slow. <coughs> if you take something else, you will typically have to sacrifice some of your precision requirements. So it will be difficult or if not impossible to just implement money as one single class. So the question is, how to represent then a numeric amount? Basically, the result of the JSRS is that we have to allow multiple numeric representations and supply extension points where we can interoperate and define rules how interoperability, interoperability between these kind of different things is ensured. Looking at the monetary amount interface, you will be probably, um, yeah, erschlagen. It's, it's huge. But basically, it's not nothing, nothing um, also that we should completely invent it on ourselves. Most of the methods you see here are the same methods that you have on big decimal, which basically is not that bad. Um, then we have some types here, int value, long value, and something like that, and value exact, uh, which is more taken from the number, Java lang number class. And then here down, that is one kind of these extension points, that's an operator. We have basically two extension points. The width is that takes an amount and gives an amount back. So it's an unary function on an amount. And there is also a query operator where you pass an amount and get back something else. That's the other, it's a functional. Um, that's the, mo the most extension points that are used. And these things are basically then implemented. As mentioned, the operators the, the on-area operator, here's it, you see how it's defined, and you see you have a couple of implementations that exactly are using that extension mechanism, and that is a good thing because all that code is separated and you don't need to include that into the monetary amount implementation and to re-implement that for each monetary amount implementation class. So we have minimum, maximum, we can have average, where you can operate on multiple amounts and get the average out of the operator at the end. We can uh, uh, have separate, where you can get out uh, that are queries, where you get out not a full amount, but here we get also only the numeric part out, only the currency. We have totals, we can minor or major part, we have can reciprocal values. Rounding and currency conversion, the last two are now typical financial operations. We also will see that in a few examples as well. 
how do you how we create an amount? Basically, if we have we have two possibilities. We can first just use the API itself. The API is based on interfaces on the monetary singleton. So I can go here and say monetary, get me a currency. And then I say, um, I can also say monetary, get default factory, um, set, uh, that's an, uh, get default amount factory, set that currency, set a number, and then build. Then I have use only API artifacts, which then in the back through the SPIs define which actual actual uh, um, amount implementation it is used. More simple is to use the reference implementation clauses, but I have then a dependency on the reference implementation. But then it's more simple. I can, say, I can simply say money of number and, for example, the currency code, and I get the, the amount out. By the way, in a new version, it's also possible that, for example, what you see above, uh, the JDK already starts doing that a lot with some of the common collection elements like list and map and others that they have multiple off factories on the interface, because since Java 8, that's allowed in the interface. Uh, this API, when it went final, it was still meant to be portable, so we didn't uh, introduce too many things that are proprietary to Java 8 and above. But with the next version, uh, basically the baseline should be Java 8. So you may see certain methods like the off actually moving into the monetary amount, so th then it's also in the API. So as mentioned, let's a bit focus on precision and rounding as next. The question is when you have an amount, and now we do some calculation with that amount, what happens? If I just duplicate an amount, it's quite simple. If I multiply something with something else, it gets a bit more complicated, especially when the multiplier is a, is a number with a huge decimal fraction. When I divide amounts, it gets even worse. And the question is, when should I round? The problem is, even when you use doubles as numerical representation, which you should never do, you can do very, very simple things, and you get into rounding issues after two or three operations, which are so big differences that basically you cannot use uh, um, doubles because the results get simply false, invalid. Um, the next question is, uh, but when you should round? The basic thing is what we did, we first have to divide which kind of, of precisions are existing. So we say first thing is the internal precision. That's what we have what is the capability of the numeric type that is in the amount, in my current amount implementation that is in use. Then we have an external precision. That is means that the precision or the rounding that we apply when we get some value out, for example, for calculation or whatever we need. Then we, we say a formatting, uh, the, uh, we define a formatting precision where we say the precision that we want to, to show for printing some, monetary, mon some amounts on some display, forms, printouts, whatever. And since we have that different uh, kind of precisions, we also have to define interoperability. How, for example, if I combine two amounts with different precision capabilities with different capabilities, what my internal representation can map, and different precisions which I apply, which I have when I use two amounts for operate with each, each other, what happens then to the target precision that gets out as a result? Are there cases where I can say, no, I must throw an error because typically it's not what the user would expect that uh, as a result when I do that thing, just on just, for example, implicitly cut off parts of my precision 
just to comply with the requirements of precision that of the other the other value that I was I am inter operating with just requires. And then we have also things like serialization, and many of these things are defined in the in the GSR, and that's a big part of the specification. Now, what is the, the, the are the key points basically? Internal rounding, that means rounding that I have to apply that I still can be capable of, of keeping my numeric representation in internally in my amount implementation is allowed. That's the only rounding that is allowed to happen implicitly. Meaning, if I have let's say a four digit integer as my internal representation then i'm really allowed to cut off any kind of precision that goes by on that four digits that is even implicitly allowed because in my amount context which i also provide I have to define and to explicitly declare that I am only capable of handling four digits. But then I am really allowed internally to even apply heavy rounding. Normally it's the other way around. Normally you have um, a representation for like, like big decimal, which is very flexible, where you can even extend uh, the precision as needed. Um, and when I do calculations between amounts of different implementations, the base precision of the, the, fur, of the, of the amount that is operated on, this precision is inherited also to the result. So I have um, a big decimal based amount and I make a calculations with a long based amount, the result is again and must be a big decimal based amount. That makes also sense when you combine that kind of calculations with queries and operators, because these are external operations which take an amount, do something and get something back. It would not make sense if that what you get back completely changes into something different than the original part, original uh, implementation I was operating on. Now, when you look at rounding, Werner already mentioned there are special cases. Many cases are, or in most cases, mathematical rounding is co was completely okay for many currencies. But it, it, it differs. First, if you calculate or do rounding for what target do you do that? You do that for just uh, for count for for managing your accounts in your bank. Then you can do whatever makes sense past the, uh, as as fractional parts. Um, if you go to a to a shop and you want to buy some things. It's, it's simply defined by the coins that are available in your country, what you can do. Here in Germany, or in, in, in Europe, we have one cent coins. In Switzerland, five is the minimum. There is nothing beyond it. We always, it's, it's 95 or it's, it's the, next, the next franc. So it makes, no, when you have to round for, for at, 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 a, at a cashier, you have to, to round to that five and nothing else. It makes no sense. Um, and there are even special countries here where, like Argentina, that's a non mathematic rounding where there are rules defined that in some cases things get rounded down, in other cases, things get rounded down as well, but with an additional digit. And in that case, they got routed up again. There is no mathematical route where this fits in. So you have to implement that somehow manually. And that's one of the, of the limits where JDK fails to map these things. 
And also there is no differentiation in the JDK, JDK between cash rounding and uh, non-cash rounding, for example. The main implementation that we have is that money rounding, and I think on the next slide, no, it's not there, you can get and access roundings from the monetary singleton as well. You can say monetary, get default rounding, and then you just apply the amount. The default rounding then will look up what is the fractional digits defined for that currency, and then uses that to round the value accordingly. But you can also define your custom roundings, where you can also access roundings by name then. <coughs> Next point is then conversion. If I have amounts in different currencies, I want to convert them properly. Main thing is that there are also here different cases. I can just go to, to a bank or to a cashier outside, say, I have 100, 100 Swiss francs, give me please US dollars. That's okay. Then I get US dollars to the currency conversion exchange rate that is valid as of now. But if I want to go back and calculate something different, let's say historical, I have to also to know what is the historical rate at that time. Or another example, if you have a stream where you can get out conversion data, typically by default, if you don't want to buy uh, or to pay much money, you will have deferred rates, typically half an hour late you will see rates that were valid be before half an hour, not the current ones. If you want the current ones, you have to pay, to pay for them. So we did defer that we have direct, and ah, another thing is that uh, we only not only have uh, just rates. Rates could be that there are, most of the currencies are, or well, in many cases are directly exchangeable. So you can go to a bank and say, give me US dollars for Swiss francs, not an issue. But if you want to convert, for example, from some exotic currency to other exotic currency, you probably will have first to do a conversion to US dollar and then go back from US dollar to the other currency. So you have then two steps conversion. That's what what is meant or defined by a derived rate. Uh, so an exchange rate basically comprises then, where is my point? Oh, I don't see it. By a conversion context, which means what kind of conversion is that? At what date was it valid? What is my provider? All that kind of stuff. Then we have a base currency and a terminating currency, meaning base currency, US dollar, I want to convert to Swiss francs, the termination. There is a conversion factor if, if it defines by which is the amount that I have to, to multiply the base currency to get the term currency. And in the case of derived rates, I also can then look up the different derived steps that I get the overall conversion. To access currencies, we have a monetary conversions singleton. And you also see there the, the exchange rate, just the, the Java interface, how it is defined. Oh, very, very, very big, big, big. Um, the question is here, how you get your exchange rate provider. An exchange rate is provided by an exchange rate provider. You can also have multiple exchange rate providers and also the reference implementation monitor uh, comes actually with multiple ones. We have, for example, the uh, European um, Central Bank, which is providing conversion rates. We have the monetary fund and the Fed from the US, which provides rights. And you see here an example how you can, for example, you get then here 
Uh, you start with 100 US dollars. You get, uh, you get out the conversion, where you just say you take the default, which actually is a chain of exchange rate providers, and the first that is able to answer your conversion will be defining your result. And then you say, I want to have a conversion where I need Brazilian real, and then I say, that's my US dollars, and give me the, the Brazilian real's value for that. And when you want to work with historic rates, I just can here uh, add special kind of exchange rate types, which here is uh, ECB HIST, which actually then goes back to an exchange rate provider name. So you can add your own, and then you can also define here additionally uh, your local date for what you con for what the conversion should be valid and pass that into a conversion query and then with that query you get the currency conversion and then the rest is the same. Yeah, as you see, Zalando is one of the company that is working with the JSR, so it's not only just a, a, a brain exercise, it's really used. And there we, is... We only have five minutes on... False demo. Probably, let's see if we... In the meantime, are there any questions? Let's do the Q&A now. Do you have a money currency database? Um, currently, the, 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 the JSR, basically, for the currencies and for the symbols, use it just what is there in the, in the JDK. But you can build, you, if you have one, you can easily add it as a supplier. For the exchange rate providers, uh, obviously the sources are, for example, the International Monetary Fund or the European Central Bank. I think, I think, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's really still there and it's maintained, but there was an implementation for a currency provider which was backing, which was uh, directly going back to the official um, ISO Unicode files that was loading the files from the internet, parsing them and building up the currency list based on that. of time, so let's see if that one runs. The problem with the JavaFX demo is that JavaFX has been recently removed from, from the JDK. So I have to build it with, with Java 8. JavaMoney.org, you come to our main project page, uh, GitHub organization that includes all the, not only the, the API and the reference implementation and the TCK, but also a large number of demos.
I would say one thing that would be interesting is if if if, if we can show the uh, Indian formatting. But let's see if it, if if we get it working here. Definitely, exchange rates make no sense. No, especially not without the internet. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not not one hundred percent sure, be, uh, true, because there is a fallback database included that is loaded if no connectivity is there, where you can get at least data that is that is, that is perhaps uh, when was the last release? Two years old. Yes. Does that already apply uh, the latest? Because one comment with the demo is that it actually has dependencies, and I'm not sure if uh, the latest snapshot is taken. In uh, I did not see anything. It's already disappeared. So in air, uh, no. That's still the JDK formatting here. It should be, the, the problem is that uh, the grouping, the first group, two, three, four, um, before the decimal point, that's correct, that should be three digits. But every other groups on the left side only shoot two digits wide. And that's the problem with the, with the decimal grouping in the JDK, because the JDK has only one fixed grouping size. It cannot be changed. In the the, the the formatter, in the formatter package, actually can take arbitrary different grouping sizes, and the last grouping size is then applied to everything else that's coming. So for India, you would say grouping size three comma two, meaning the first group is three digits. Every group afterwards or bigger only has two digits. I guess we can't go too much into detail here, but there's a, a test bench uh, that I'm just showing here that you find under the Java FX uh, module of Java Money examples, and that shows uh, many of the examples uh, and test cases that we also had in the slides. For example, conversion rate, obviously because we, uh, the Wi-Fi doesn't really work here, right now uh, accessing this to see does it go back yeah, good you have a oh, wait, you have an identity an yeah. identity conversion which that's, is one I don't know Australian dollars oh yeah it seems to work so that 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 already uses the cached <laughs> Local result, uh, and here you have the conversion from Swiss francs to Australian dollars using the international monetary Yeah, fund. you see there, the, the, the provider, the date is the 31 May in 2018. Yeah, so it, it has been cached for a little while. <laughs> but if you, if you run that with a working internet connection, then the conversion provider will actually try to gather recent data from either the International Monetary Fund or the European Central Bank. And because all those demos have dependencies, I guess we still need to update them to the latest snapshot. But as, at the very least, when the maintenance release uh, Moneta 1.4 goes live, then all the demos will also pick it up. And then the, the Indian rupee example that Anato already fixed uh, will also manifest itself in a format demo. So I would say thank you very much for listening to us. And if you have some more questions, I will be around for a half an hour, something uh, outside. And if not, thank you otherwise, for listening. Otherwise, please go to travelmoney.org. Uh, we also have a groups uh, forum where you can ask questions that will be answered by either of us or other members of the team.